chat GTP4 came out yesterday. Pretty amazing. I, I didn't understand half the stuff they were talking about, but it looked a lot faster than the current one, which is pretty fast. I mean, I saw that it passed uh, in the top 10%, 90%. pretty much every standardized test that they yeah. bet they've vetted so far. All of them. The, um, I don't think it's done the MCAT yet. At least I didn't see that. I but think they came in an 88% 80, 80, 80 on the LSAT or something. Pretty. Yeah. <clears throat> Better than I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be kind of like the iPhone where, you know, the first one launched and it was really exciting and they make incremental improve, improvements, but nothing is going to be as exciting as the feeling you get when you start chatting with it the very first time. <laughs> yeah. And how fast it is, right? Yeah. It's got the answer produced before faster than you can read it. Yeah, definitely. Maybe we'll do, uh, let's do a quick Q&A here. I got one for you, Guy, that came in, I think, yesterday from an audience mem member. Propensity of chat GP to confidently provide incorrect information or hallucinate is well documented. Is there an efficient way to limit that in legal preparation, or will everything AI produces have to be double-checked? Well, today, everything's got to be double-checked. You know, and that's I think that's going to be part of our conversation today. Yeah. You know, this is very... Uh, in its current context, I'm going to say that and people are going to be like, well, no, AI has been around for a long time. Right. But this whole chat GPT thing is just getting warmed up. And so, but as I think also we'll discuss, you know, the, the speed with which AI improves mm -hmm. is far superior to most other technology we're familiar with. And so, you know, I say that today, yes. I mean, I know we have some examples today. You better check it because it gets stuff wrong all the time. Uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, strap in folks. So when they say hallucinate, is, does that mean they just comes up with a completely random answer or? Yeah, it, well, it, it makes up its own facts. It makes up its own sources. Right. That's kind of scary, right? Like, that is. Um, yeah. Mark Palmer showed an example where he was doing some, and we'll talk about some of the ways you might use it. Um, doing some legal research and it created up its created its own case law <laughs> with with citations and sources. I know a few lawyers that created their own documents and got disbarred. You know, you only get one kick at the can when you're counseling <laughs> right. stuff like that, right? That's true. People right. aren't perfect either. Shannon, what are we talking about today? Welcome, everybody, by the way. Yes, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate you all joining us for today's discussion on a very hot topic right now, artificial intelligence. It's fair to say recent developments and innovation in AI have impacted all sectors. However, today's presentation will primarily be focused on the legal industry. And we have the pleasure of having our guest legal tech and marketing experts to join the panel with Russell. So our presenters will be discussing what is AI? recent progress, why should lawyers and clients care, improve service efficiencies and access to justice, ethics, marketing, content generation considerations, will there still be a role for lawyers, should AI replace judges and decision makers, the tipping point and a new frontier is at the end of Google search, and our speakers will also be answering audience questions throughout the presentation, and we'll also reserve a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Without further ado, I'm going to take a few moments to tell you a bit more about our panelists before they get started with the presentation. So first we have Jerry. Jerry Zhao is the CEO of Doc Equity, where he drives the company's vision for the next generation of work and knowledge automation. Prior to Doc Equity, Jerry led product teams at Microsoft, building productivity experiences for knowledge workers on the cutting edge of AI and interactive technologies. Jerry currently resides in Seattle with his wife, 15-month daughter, and their great Pyrenees, Lyra. Next, we have Conrad Sam. And after leading marketing efforts for Avo, Conrad founded Mockingbird, an online marketing agency focused on, exclusively on legal. Called the Gary V of Legal, Conrad is the author of Own the Map, published by the American Bar Association and the Fine Law Jailbreak Guide. Also the co-host of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing with Guy Sakalakis, a Google Small Business Advisor, and held positions for various ABA's practice management marketing committees. A semi-professional bridge arsonist, Conrad enjoys publishing 
cease and desist letters from unscrupulous legal marketing vendors. Conrad is the proud owner of Zippy, the first and only chicken to be awarded the Lawyers of Distinction Top 10% 10% award, which recognizes lawyers duped into buying a $700 annual subscription to a plaque. Shannon, is, is Conrad setting you up with this stuff? Or what? <laughs> that is all. Conrad's true. bio. I'd love to hear more. I'm intrigued. <laughs> it's essentially an indictment on the entire legal marketing industry just in his bio alone. It's amazing. <laughs> what a marketer. I've got to give props to these two guys. The Lunch Hour Legal Marketing is a fantastic podcast. Uh, we'll try to get into the show notes. It's just great. But sorry to cut you off, Shannon. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Guy. Guy Sakalaki's founded Attorney Sync to help lawyers grow their practices. As a non-practicing lawyer himself, he is a familiar he's familiar with the unique considerations of effectively and ethically marketing a law practice. He's also the current co-chair of the American Bar Association's Tech Show, co-host of the Lunch Hour Legal Marketing Podcast, as Russell mentioned, with Conrad, an investor and advisor to legal tech, including Law Maddox and Gideon. Guy is also passionate about stoicism, Michigan football, and coffee, but not necessarily in that order. And last but not least, we have Russell, who is the founder and senior partner at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. And with 25 years of experience, he uses his knowledge and expertise to surface clients in all aspects of family law and helps them in coping with the difficulties of separation and divorce. The division of assets such as homes and pensions and the calculation and enforcement of child and spousal support. He uses his experience to create unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward and supports them through the transition of divorce and separation. So I know that I am very much looking forward to today's discussions with our panelists over the next hour and we hope you are too and we really hope you enjoy the presentation. And on that note, I'm going to pass things over to Russell to get started. Yeah, I'm always excited about doing our events, but this one I'm particularly excited about, Shannon. I know I've been talking to you all week about it because it really can change our industry. So what we're going to do for our audience members, we're going to be doing polls throughout. Here's one right now. Um, please answer the polls. It helps us understand our audience. We can kind of tailor our content based on who is in our audience, and it helps us understand um, where you're coming from. We have Q&A. If you have questions, we're going to be taking questions from the audience throughout. We've had some questions that came in in advance, and I thank everybody for sending those in. What we're talking about, there's going to be lots of show notes for you after this presentation. So we'll give you lots of follow-up information. And we may have a surprise for you halfway through. We'll see how things are going. But first of all, let's see who our audience is. So let's see our poll results from poll number one. All right, 62% family lawyer, um, other lawyer, different profession, 23%, other professional, 3%, tech industry, going through a separation and divorce, 4%, and we've got six law students joining us today. Welcome to the law students. I always love it when we have students show up. All right, so let's get into it. What is AI? All right, Jerry, what do we okay. need to know? Help us out. We all hear about chat GPT. It's sexy. It's on the news. Everybody's talking about it. What is it? Well, I think we should get a little background on AI just to kind of wrap your mind around what this buzzword is, right? So what most people don't realize is that AI is already everywhere. We're using AI when you ask Alexa about weather in the morning, um, or it's used when your credit card's stolen and the transaction's declined, or when your iPhone makes a really cute photo montage. And so don't think about AI as what it is. What it is isn't really super interesting. I think it's just a computational method based on approximation and statistics. But how we use it is a lot more interesting because AI is right now, what's doing is it's bridging the gap between uh, computer work and human work. Human. What that means is that, that we're means using it to perform tasks in environments that have way too many possibilities for what classical computing has handled in the last 50 years. So like, for example, think about something like Google search. The internet has 5 billion web pages and people can literally type whatever they want in the search bar. And the only way of solving this problem is you need to be able to surface the relevant web page to the user that's approximating things like, you know, what they typed in, their location, their time of day. And you're trying to find a good result based on what people on the internet seem to have to say about each web page. Um, and 
if you take something like self-driving cars, we have, you know, our roads aren't really built to handle something like that. Our roads are so open-ended. It's not like these cars are on tracks. Anything can happen. Other cars can break the rules. People can jump in front of you. So instead of handling every single possibility, people approach this by building a model, which takes an environment and approximates a result. So for self-driving cars, the result is like, what's the angle of your steering wheel? What is the percentage of your gas? What is the percentage of your um, brakes, depending on all the objects detected around the vehicle? And so we're going to get to something like um, ChatGPT, which is probably the most relevant here, which is this is a language model that's a lot more specific than the examples we just mentioned. Most of the um, existing AI that we use today are basically an ensemble of different models. So take something like Alexa, which is doing something like voice to text, then text to intent, then intent to search. But ChatGPT is different. And in my opinion, it's probably the most elegant model because all it's doing is taking some words and approximating what the next sequence of words should be. And it's been trained on essentially the entire corpus of written knowledge in the world. And it's able to identify some types of patterns as um, what's coming up next that we don't really understand even at the pinnacle of the tech world. Anyway, to wrap this up, if you read the boring definition of AI from the dictionary, it's really gonna describe to you how AI is a computer's way of doing human tasks. But I mean, if you think about it from the larger picture, it's something like, look, a person can go and read a web page and tell you whether that web page is helpful or not. And now I can build an AI that can do the same. But it misses the whole point of AI, because unlike a person who is limited to reading articles one at a time, the AI can read the entire Internet and millions of web pages that are being updated at any given moment. And that's the beauty of AI, which is the ability to scale these tasks to the infinite for essentially zero cost. Amazing, exciting stuff. And we're going to take a deeper dive, but let's get our feedback from our audience. So next poll question, do you think you will lose your job to AI? And I've got, uh, you know, we've written about this. Lawyers are of the view, nobody's going to replace us. We're smarter than everybody. You know, we, we got empathy. We're going to hold the person's hand. We can understand things that AI can't. Uh, but Let's see what our audience thinks. And while we're waiting for our audience, Jerry, I'm going to throw a question at you uh, that came in yesterday. What types of data are necessary for training artificial intelligence, algorithms, and family law? And how can we ensure that this data is representative and unbiased? And we probably talk about an hour on that, but uh, I'll give you 30 yeah. seconds or so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, when when I think about this question, I think that the first thing that comes to my mind is it's not about what type of data you need, but what kind of experience are you trying to achieve? And, you know, I'm not an attorney, but when I think about the future experience that we probably want, uh, you can reduce a lot of the stress around making sure that the information or facts are represented correctly. Uh, you can essentially have two people agree to um, wanting to like create proceedings for a divorce and then sync their entire digital footprint to this AI so the AI can make sure and collect all the aspects of the case that um, typically right now take you know months and a lot of court proceedings to, to go do because uh, in some ways this will be relatively impartial. And uh, to make sure that it's representative and unbiased, that part of the question, I think just points to how important it is still to have humans in the loop for all of these types of tasks. Yeah, and we're, there's an article we're going to include in the show note where they actually re, they they remove certain information, right? Age, race, yeah. gender, and the AI got it worse once you remove that kind of data, right? It kind of needs that to provide context. But let's see what our audience is thinking about their jobs. Um, do you think you lose your job to AI? Yes, twenty percent. No. 80%, very confident uh, group of audience members here today. I like that. But the next slide I think is kind of telling. It's uh, a quote that I, I uh, heard Brett mention in uh, Texas last week. AI will not replace you. A uh, person using AI will replace you, right? So your job's still gonna be there, but if you're not using AI, somebody else using AI will likely take over your job. So I thought that was kind of a neat quote we'd throw in there. Um, Let's just see what our audience, our panelists think about this quote. Uh, Guy, you think um, somebody using AI is going to take over? Uh, yes, in the in the short period of time. I mean, again, I I think of it like where we are today, and um, I think 
And I, I always think of, uh, so Robert Reich, who was a former labor secretary, always, this always feels like a good place to think about this, but he breaks types of work into three different types of work, right? Uh, symbolic, analytics, like I think lawyers think about that when they, you know, interpreting case law, that kind of stuff. Um, in-person services. So that might lawyers do some of that too, because I think we talked about the empathy, building a relationship with the client, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then there's just like the, you know, the production line type of work and lawyers do some of that too. And by the way, a lot of lawyers do charge a lot of money for some of that production stuff. So my viewpoint is this, if you spend most of your time and are charging your clients for production stuff that can be uh, more efficiently handled by technology, you're in trouble. That part of your work is going to get smaller and smaller. Symbolic analytics and in person, you know, symbolic analytics is going to take longer for the AI to catch up to, but I, I believe personally that they will eventually, it's just not there yet. And then so it comes back to this in person service stuff. Like that's where you can still hang your hat because at the end of the day, you're a trusted advisor, you're an expert that the client actually trusts. And let me tell you, that will be the last thing to go because people, even when the AI gets really, really good, there's going to be people that are just skeptical and cynical about a machine representing them almost the just... gatekeeper role right right there'll be gatekeepers and there'll be ai but i see you all get in on this conrad what do you think well i mean i i would think i think an, a really good parallel to think about this on is the practice of math Ma mathematician someone who actually did work as a mathematician used to be a profession right um and now what we have uh everyone who has excel can get really really advanced mathematics um really easily and you have wizards to walk you through that like it's it's easy enough to do it's you get it tool. on your phone now it's now you can do it on your phone right but yeah. it, it is now the interpretation the analysis the judgment that comes with and, and what do you do about the answer not getting to that answer which is the critical yeah. piece right and i i use that as in my own head because i'm so fascinated with the content side of this but the, the development of content and then the consumption of content fundamentally changes but the critical piece which is the judgment and the analysis behind that doesn't yeah jerry uh, let's get your take on this and then we're going to move into your topic which is recent progress what do you think of um brett's quote well i think it's a competitive advantage and uh the world kind of needs it in some ways because even in family law when i think about like something like the client experience where people are really stressed out all the time. Maybe people will build their own AI bot that you can kind of uh, just ping 30 times a day when you're really worried about your family law issue. And right. that's kind of like the first line of defense that then allows the lawyer to just go and work on your case. So maybe there's a client experience there as well. Well, think of, for the lawyers in the audience, right? If we prepare a client application, might be three hours, maybe more, maybe less. AI can punch it out in 30 seconds. And you clean it up, send it at the door. You know, you're gonna your pricing and your your competition is gonna be doing this. So if you're not thinking about it, you're gonna be left behind. But let's talk about recent progress, Jerry. What do we need to know? What's well, GPT four was yesterday, right? They're talking about it. Yeah, they are. Uh, and you know, even before we go to GPT four, I think it's uh, interesting to kind of just talk about the history, so you can get some context into like how AI is developed and why we're seeing so much of it right now. And, you know, we're gonna have to go back in time and nerd out a little bit. So if you think about the 1950s, when computers were still new, some guys from Cornell came up with this idea of a math function, it's called a neural network. And this is part of the AI that I was saying earlier, that's not very interesting, but really relevant, because it's basically the thing that everything runs on uh, today. And the idea of a neural network is if you feed it some data, and the system is fast enough to process the data you feed it, it's able to guess anything. And it's a really powerful idea, but really theoretical, because the other thing I mentioned is that, you know, it's it takes a lot of computing power. And the, the nice thing about it is that it can use many computers at once. So fast forward to the 1990s, a computer company called NVIDIA, which you guys probably know, um, started producing computer chips that were really good at rendering graphics and video games, Pixar, things like calculating reflections and uh, from the uh, reflections of light from water in a video game. And uh, the thing they produce is called the graphics card. And the graphics card has 10,000 cores today, where in comparison, some computer that you're using probably to dial into Zoom right now has four to eight cores. Now you see this in the era of cloud computing, where you have a server farm with another 10,000 graphics cards and each one with 10,000 cores. 
And you combine that with something like neural networks, and this has created an explosion in AI where like uh, technologists are basically using this for everything from calculating AI in the stock market to audio files, to video files, to images, anything that you can place your hands on that has digital data. And right now, ChatGPT is the apex of this kind of compute. And I can't stress enough how much computing power it needs to take. It has all the resources on Azure behind it. And we are at GPT-4, which is really exciting, but it's still really slow and limited. And the point of describing this history here is for you to see kind of where it's going to go, because in my opinion, this stuff is really powerful. And it's a powerful word pattern tool, but I think don't think like any number of parameters you're going to put in this thing is going to make it sentient. But I do think that as we get faster computing, this is going to be everywhere in our digital experiences and probably in like every single text box that you're going to type on a computer in some form. Yeah, it's really quite amazing. I, I view it, you know, you see those graphs, right? And it's just taking off compared to where we were 20 years ago. And it's with, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a super tech guy, but if the computers are getting more powerful and we're getting more da more data, it's just going to be exp exponential, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So why should lawyers care? We've got lots of lawyers in our audience uh, today. Guy, what should we be letting our lawyers in our audience think about? Well, I think we've already answered that question, right? I mean, it's a huge, com huge competitive advantage. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the other, the other aspect of this that we'll talk about is, and this has already been happening even without AI, is that the market legal services consumer marketplace is end running lawyers for a variety of different things. And AI is going to enable them to do that even more. So again, if you're a, a client or you're, uh, you know, thinking you've got the life legal issue, AI is going to play a role, whether, you know, Jerry mentioned uh, people is the ability to create your own chat bots. Um, the cost comes down, the ease increases. You're going to be able to get answers to your questions. Now we'll talk about this is the reliability of those answers and all that kind of jazz. Um, but from a lawyer's standpoint, I mean, it's a, it's gotta be a no brainer for most folks. I would think, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you're trying to practice law without a cell phone or a computer. You know, I remember even <laughs> we founded our business in 2007, lawyers would say things like, oh, you know, I don't, I just you need a yellow pad and a pen. And I'm like, sure, you probably can practice that way, but what a competitive disadvantage, what a disservice to your clients. And, and ultimately, you know, clients are going to, in, in certain contexts, maybe, um, maybe less so in family law, but there's going to be an expectation that you're using technology to be able to deliver the best experiences and the most efficient experiences. And so if you send someone a bill for scanning documents, people are going to start waking up to that. And, uh, you know, again, one of those things that AI is going to be able to uh, make much more efficient. So. Well, the rules of professional conduct require us to deliver um, our services in an efficient manner and be up to date with technology. And if you're not up to date with AI, you might not be complying with your regulators requirements as well. Right. I mean, I, you know, I love that and I, it's aspirational, but I've learned, you know, we just had the ABA tech show and like, you see what the standards for tech competency are in the United States. And you're just like, whoa, we got a long way to go. But yes, we do have a tech competency part of the practice of law in the States. So that's a good thing. And in Canada. Uh, all right, let's go to our next poll question. See what our audience is thinking. Hopefully everybody's still awake and with us. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Have you heard of artificial intelligence being used in the context of a family law case before? You know, this, this will be interesting. I think there was some media and we're going to have in the show notes, I think um, there was an AI lawyer helping with the traffic ticket or something to that effect. Um, I, I don't know if you guys came across the story. Uh, the other one that I thought was kind of entertaining and we'll have it in the show notes that the Colombian judge, I think it was, used AI to write the court's decision. Um, so it's starting to creep in, in my view, but let's see if our audience has heard of it being used in a family law context. Uh, let's see our poll results. Yes, 15%. No, 83%. Other, 2%. You can put your comments and your questions in the uh, Q&A box or the chat box. We're going to get to them. But let's go to... Our next topic, which is going to be improved service efficiencies and access to justice. And I think this is back to you, Guy. Is that right? 
Yes, it is. Um, but I'm also open to anybody who wants to provide feedback. I mean, I, again, it kind of goes back to this point of um, this idea of a, you know, kind of twofold. One is the efficiency stuff and the, and the improved service. And I think Conrail will talk about this as well, but, you know, building client experiences that are more efficient, that don't require you to be, you know, driving direction is an obvious one. Like, do you really need to get on the phone with the client and tell them, give them driving directions? Or is that the type of thing that an AI chatbot could assist with something like that? Um, document review, I think is a, a, a no brainer. Legal research is a no brainer. You know, the expectations are going to be, you can't bill the same way as you used to be able to bill. You're, it's already happening in the context of big law. It's gonna trickle down in my opinion for, um, into the uh, consumer market. Access to justice. Same thing, you know, the, um, you know, there are a lot of people right now, uh, all the studies are that, you know, lawyers for certain things, they just can't afford a lawyer, it's too expensive. Um, so consumers are already end rounding um, the justice system to get answers to their questions. And, and I think it was interesting to see the poll results. I think Jerry made this point too, is a lot of people don't realize, but like anytime your client types divorce lawyer near me, they're, that's, they're using AI in the context of their life legal issue to find a lawyer. Anytime they type a question in, you know, what are my um, custody rights? You know, wh what happens in my, whether it's um, province, city, state, uh, zip code, um, people that are asking those questions, AI has already been a part of that conversation. It's just now that the, um, the inter the interaction with the chat GPT is a different experience. And, and again, I, I think the point that we've all been making, you're going to start to see this really take off. And so people are going to be going to these AI uh, assisted technologies for answers to legal, legal questions. All right. So great summary. Thank you for that key. Let's go over back to our audience. We've got lots of polls today. We've got some comments coming in as well. Will chat GTP replace Google for search? Some of our audience questions, um, there, some, some, one of our audience members heard of uh, programs and AI programs in states to draft simple motion to research, do research and um, estimate parole length. That's kind of interesting. Another one came in here. Uh, would using AI for court applications be a concern for privacy? So we got a duty to keep our clients' information confidential. We plug it into the uh, to the matrix or whatever the AI system of the day is. Is, is that a breach of our our solicitor client privilege? What do you think? Yeah, I see you're nodding your head there. It's a, it's, a, it's an interesting thought, right? Because you're not you're you're letting your clients' data out there into the world. So yeah, and I would say it uh, depends on what the prompt is. Um, but you know, there, right now. Uh, there's a whole uh, debate about whether lawyers should be even allowed to respond to negative reviews. And I'm going to tie back to why this is related to this. But, you know, if you just even as a lawyer, even if you acknowledge, say a client leaves a review and says, hey, you know, this lawyer represented me and they did a bad job. Even just responding in certain jurisdictions in the United States, that's a violation of confidentiality. Because even though the client essentially outed themselves as your client, Lawyers have this obligation and they're not, you're not supposed to even say that they were a client um, in certain jurisdictions. So same thing here. If you're, even if you're typing publicly available information in as the lawyer, there's an argument to say that you're breaching confidentiality. It's, I mean, it's the same context as a response to a negative review, in my opinion. And certainly if you're typing in information that you have because you're a lawyer, like I would not do that. Absolutely not. Divorce Mate's a program in Canada we use to generate court pleadings. And one of our audience mes messages to, you know, we're giving it to Divorce Mate, but I guess that's different, right? It's a private contract service maintaining our client's privilege. And it's, there's some control over it. With AI, maybe the AI is going to use our client data for other people's searches. I don't know. And, and can I chime in to just be a little contrarian here, which is ah. that we we give information to Google yeah. all the time in search, yeah. and no one thinks about that. So, uh, I, I this this problem probably will go away soon because at some point it'll be fast enough to like run on your phone, so it's not going to give information, and you're going to have one of those like Apple privacy agreements where you just check that you don't want to share this information, and hopefully that this will go away. I'd also say that 
I mean, the enforcement of this, they're really struggling to catch up to the basics of technology, understanding how this would work and then enforcing um, privacy through AI. Like I, I mean, it's Phil, I think the, uh, the philosophy major in here is thinking uh, big picture on this, but I, I don't know how this becomes actually enforced, right? Like what? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you how, I'll, just like every other, this is how it happens every single time. The same thing with the negative review stuff. There's, you know, no one can prove the actual harm. There's no clients that are like, my lawyer uh, breached my yeah. confidentiality because they typed something into AI. But guess who does? The competition. And the competition you hauls you into court and says, I know this lawyer has been typing client information in chat GPT, files the professional grievance, and that's how it gets regulated, right? Self-regulating body, folks. Yeah. I'm just thinking of those senators questioning the IT companies and Facebook, and they, they have no idea what the hell is going on, right? It's like, the horse has left the barn. You're not going to get it back in there. And I think we're going to see that with AI, but let's see what our audience thinks here. And I like this question, this poll, because I remember Yellow Pages, right? There used to be the thing called Yellow Pages, and you'd advertise there. And I was talking to my Yellow Page rep about Google. And at the time, Yellow Pages could have bought Google. Oh, yeah, that's we're not worried about that. Three years later, Yellow Pages was gone and people were using Google. I think we could see something similar with chat in relation to Google. Uh, so it's going to replace search. Our audience says 20%. Yes. No, 21%. Maybe. Of course, lawyers are going to say it depends. 52%. Love the answers there. All right. And we've got we've got questions coming in about specifically chat GPT-4. We're going to get to that, but let's go into Conrad's uh, specialty of ethics and marketing and content generation. Over to you, Conrad. What do we need to know? I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. How is that for an oxymoron? Ethics and marketing, right? <laughs> it's the Billy marketing. Madison quiz, right? The you you got to meet my chicken zippy. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, the fascinating thing on all of this on the, and, and by the way, I, I will very quickly dodge the ethics question because I think, um, this really gets uh, into the legal ethics, which is something that Guy can talk about ad nauseum, and I, I can talk about only from a philosophical perspective. On the marketing side of this, um, there's been, you know, when, when I first, ChatGPT came out during a college football game, uh, I don't know how long ago. It feels like forever ago at this point in time. But I was watching college football with one of my friends, and uh, we all stopped watching the game to mess around with ChatGPT. Um, and we were all we're all kind of nerdy Seattle people. And the original thought was like, what does this do from an SEO perspective? And I think it's worthy to get deep into that. There are, and and I'd be curious on Guy's perspective on this, but there are three kind of fundamental elements of winning the SEO game. One is technology, one is content, and one is your site's overall authority. Conrad, We've gone to a point just, now. Can yeah. you just, in two seconds or less, just tell the audience what, what SEO is? They may not. Oh, good Lord. Uh, okay, so um, you search for coffee cup on Google, and what shows up organically, not without an ad, for coffee cup, right? Um, so that's, and those, so the, when you say organically, those are just the search <laughs> results that are not paid on your Google screen unpaid correctly and Parts. not and i'm specifically not speaking about the map that shows up as well which is called local search sorry to cut you off i just want our audience no no, no totally fair I, yeah. I i i appreciate um so so winning that game and this is what like this is how i made my career in legal uh, it's called seo it's the game of, of of showing up well for search results without paying for it there's three legs to that stool. One is the technology, one is the content, and one is the overall site authority. The technology has improved. Most of you have websites that are uh, well-built enough that th th it is no longer a distinguishing factor. Back in the day, it used to be I could rebuild a website, and all of a sudden, because we put you on a better website platform, you're winning where you used to be losing. That's no longer the case. That technology, by and large, has been solved. Content now by and large has been solved. And the strategy behind that is, has not necessarily, um, you have to think about this strategically, but the actual ability to generate content and, and have no, like we should, when we're talking about content and SEO, it, it is worthy of taking a side note and saying, Google 
when when this came out, and actually before ChatGPT came out, they knew it was coming, and they had a fairly anti AI generated content policy, which means if content is being generated by ChatGPT, for example, you're um, going to get punished, right? They would deprecate that content specifically or the site overall. Right. That was the threat. When the horse left that barn, they have completely 180 this and said, well, we don't like it unless it's written for for you know being helpful for the end user. Well, of course it's being written helpfully for the end user. Um, and so so they've they've A changed their policy and B, I believe that you can generate content completely artificially without it being identifiable to an algorithm. Now there's been plenty of examples of algorithms that have been able to identify AI generated content. But I, I do believe that you can scrub your content enough and edit your They've content. They've got programs enough. that will wash your AI, put 100%. a spelling mistake or a grammatical mistake. You can't detect it anymore, right? So it used to be, this goes back, this is just kind of a, a, a trip down history. It used to be one of the ways you could generate content for the web was you would take English content, you would translate it into Spanish, then translate it into Farsi, and then translate it back into English with a computer. Right, and you generate new content because it that process of translating um, made re created new content. Except it was really, really bad content. It didn't lex like like it didn't make sense from a lexicon perspective. That's different now. We can use computers to generate lots of content. So my point being that I'm rambling on the ability to generate vast amounts of content from an SEO perspective as being a competitive advantage is no longer a competitive advantage, right? Yeah. And so now you are left with uh, the backlink profile, which is has always been the hardest thing to do. It has always been the primary distinguisher in really, really hyper-competitive markets and, and increasingly across the web. And so it does change this from an SEO perspective because you're taking away that one, that one piece of advantage that some lawyers had, which was we've just got a large page count. Yeah. All right, long-winded. Our, our blog, Family Law... Oh. LLB, family LLB, we produce content, use research lawyers, look at the court of appeal. When this came out in December, the AI, I crushed a 30 days of content in 10 minutes. And I ran a program called 30 Days of AI. And I put it and we we got the audience to say, is this useful? Over 80% found it was helpful and useful. And I was concerned where I was gonna get punished, right? You feel like you're doing something wrong. You're produ you're publishing something produced by a computer. We clearly said it was. But I was always worried about Google, you know, blacklisting the site or taking us down. But let's see what our audience thinks. I think it's time for another poll question and find out uh, what our audience is thinking on the subject. Should hey, I? Russ, while they're while they're doing that, let's let's talk about Ken's question. This is a great question. I want to read it out because I think yeah. this is a really practical question to what we're talking about very philosophically said, should ai be subject to the rules forbidding the unauthorized practice of law please put your answers in go ahead come right yeah so so ken asked is the future work for family lawyers to be found primarily in serving as mediators for people who cannot afford a lawyer or who choose not to hire a divorce lawyer and the, the reason i like this question one of the things that i've thought about with ai uh specifically for family law is uh, those of you who are unfamiliar with Erin Levine at Hell of Divorce, you should familiarize yourself with her. Um, this is a movement towards a, an assisted model, right? A sometimes lawyer assisted model, but often a self done do it yourself model. Um, it's interesting to, for, for family, right? And, and everyone in family law knows, and, and Guy and I have been getting this our entire career, when you talk to a family lawyer, from a marketing perspective, what, what do they always ask for? I want more qualified clients. What does qualified clients mean? People who can afford me. And so the justice gap is very real because we haven't used technology to serve people lower down in the socioeconomic scene. And AI changes that. The, the opportunity for AI, Aaron Levine's changing that at Hello Divorce, but the opportunity for AI to go even deeper and that assisted DIY through AI generated content. I mean, Jerry mentioned this at the very beginning, right? Um, I think is very, very real. And, and, and consumers are going to, to do it regardless, right? Consumers are going to do it because they need a better solution that we're currently not providing. I think the one, the one uh, lawyer in the US using AI, the state regulator told him to stop because it was improper practice of law. But let's see what our audience thinks about this poll question. That was great, Conrad. Thank you. All right. So should it be forbidden as unauthorized practice of law? Yes. Ah. 
Um, mm. uh, if it's being used by a non-lawyer, 43%. No, if it's being supervised by a licensed lawyer, 30%. That's no different than us supervising our paralegals or law clerks. We're just, just supervising the AI. That make, kind of makes sense. Yes, subject to proper enforcement. Well, we can't, you know, the horse sale, the bar and house, the Law Society of Ontario or other regulators going to get this back in. And, you That's know, right. It might be practically impossible. Um, you'd need a whole department, right? Just a censorship department on AI. Other, uh, we've got some other responses we're going to put into the chat. Thank you for that. All right, where are we at here? Will there still be a role for lawyers? Key. Yes. All right. Lawyers, yes. We can end, we can end the program now. All right, John, right? move on. For now, for now. Um, log it off, we're good. Yeah. For now, okay. So what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, lawyers still use their professional judgment, even with even in the context that we're going to talk about, whether it's predictive analytics, document analysis, decision support, mediation, dispute resolution, like the AI helps the lawyer, right? But the lawyer ultimately still doing a lot of things um, that are very valuable to the client and very valuable in leading to better outcomes and client experiences. And so it's just a shift. It's a change in, it's a, you know, I, I hate to reduce it because it is remarkable. And, and again, we're still at the tip of the iceberg here. Um, but it's the same thing as a lawyer having tools to support communication, right? It just makes you better, more efficient. Um, I think in some ways it's going to be able to provide you with insights and analysis that you might not even thought of yourself because it's, it's drawing from such a, uh, it's so fast at drawing from such a vast body of information that we're not great at that. Um, but does that mean it's going to replace you? No. I mean, again, and I think it's interesting too, in the context of the uh, conversation, the, uh, Ken's question, you know, and, and Aaron talks about this too, but you know, a lot of legal services consumers that weren't going to hire a lawyer, they're going to Google looking for answers and all that kind of stuff. A, 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 a lawyer using AI might actually convert more of those legal services consumers into clients by educating them about the stuff that they don't know and the, and the limitations of what the AI can do by itself. And so, again, I think it's an opportunity for lawyers who embrace it, both from a marketing standpoint, from an efficiency standpoint, for a service standpoint. Um, but no, lawyers are going to be around. I mean, look, no court. Well, I shouldn't say that. We'll see. I mean, don't say no to anything because who knows in this world. But um, I think courts it depends, right? Yeah, it depends. It depends. But I, I think there's going to be um, the short version is the litigators are going to be safe, right? If you go to court, there's going to be a very strong pushback from courts right. to allow uh, completely automated um, AI well, we're to. Getting, we're getting pushed back. They're dragging us back into in-person hearings, right? Lawyers right. want to stay on the <laughs> in their car or at the cod. Now they're dragging us back to court and making us wait six hours for our hearing. You're right? safe. You're safe. Yeah. The uh, couple couple takeaways from that um, that I really like, you know, there I came across this list. There's like 350 prompts, commands to give to AI. But one interesting was one was, tell me my blind spots, right? What am I not seeing in this document or in this argument? And it identifies for you all the things you've overlooked or may have forgotten or just didn't think was relevant, which is an incredibly powerful tool, right? To be able to find, you know, the gaps in your work. But Jerry, we haven't heard from you for a while. What do you think of lawyers? Should we be worried? Is there still a role for us? Um, in, in some ways, I think about what Conrad was saying about mathematicians being replaced. And uh, it's it's very, it, it at face value, it's really scary because, uh, it looks like it can do all these tasks, but it's really just really more of a testament of lawyers working with language so much, right? It's not really doing your deeper level thinking. It's not going to be, it can't even hold that much context today. Like AI today can only uh, hold about 3000 words of context to maintain. Whereas your brain, who knows how much context that can hold for you. So um, I, I think it'll do a lot of the text-based work for you and if you're a lawyer that's pretty tech savvy, then you'll start investing in tools that can start essentially automating your own knowledge and your corpus of experience. Yeah, and we're building right now software designed for family lawyers to make us more efficient, to help our clerks more efficient and help more clients ultimately. But let's run our, we've got a couple of polls we're gonna run right now. I wanna to go to our audience questions while we're running these polls. So our first poll 
should lawyers be required to identify documents produced by AI? I guess almost like a watermark. You know, the court's going to be relying on, we're officers of the court, we have a duty to provide the court with accurate information. If it's being produced uh, by AI, should we have to identify that for the court or our clients or other people? Uh, so we'll give everybody a moment to answer that poll question. Um, there is a question about how chat GPT is currently used for research purposes. Um, Jerry, I think it's pretty obvious, right? You get the case law, you get the summary, you want to check yep. it. Yep. Uh, one, one suggestion from our audience, thank you for this. Uh, don't upload the client's name or other identifying information when using. Um, you know, that's a good way to protect the client's identification and solicitor client privilege. Just put the fact scenario in with no names or identifying marks and then get the, the result back. That's actually a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, what else we got going on here? Should the LSO regulate AI as a legal service? We kind of touched upon that. Um, okay, lost here. We're going to get back to those. It's what our audience is thinking. Should be required to identify documents. Yes, it should be watermarked, 50%. No, because of the delay efficiencies that's inherent, 35%. No, we shouldn't use AI, 1% and other. So watermarks and AI, I guess you can wash it now, right? Because you can have programs that'll clean it up so you can't tell it was generated by AI. Is that right, Jerry? Uh, yeah, well, I've always thought this made no sense. Are you going to identify documents made by your paralegal or like an intern or something that right. does the first pass? At the it's end of the day, slope, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, that's a great point. All right. One more quick poll question, and then we're going to go into our next topic. And we got, should uh, we have our next poll question up, Shannon? Okay. We're going to give her a minute. Well, here we go. No, no, I'm thinking about the extended one. So we'll come back to that, but let's go to our next topic. Should AI replace judges and decision makers? Jerry, we've got the case of it in Colombia. Uh, judge delegate, you know, just produced the decision using AI. What do you think of this? Well, if this goes back to that conversation about like, I, I think the word replace is kind of strong because it's really about who's responsible, right? So like in, in these cases, even if the judge is delegating it, he's not saying that he's going to abide by whatever decision the AI makes. He's looking over it. And if he doesn't like it, then he's obviously going to change that. So my gut reaction there is that uh, it's not really an issue of replacement. It's um, it's going to be the same stuff with now you're the overlord over AI. But on the other side, I started thinking about this a little deeper when we talked about this before this call. And I was like, well, actually, we get really reliant on technology. Like a great example is I've lived in my house for six, seven years now. And uh, I still don't know how to get to the Costco that I go to every weekend because I just pop in my GPS and I listen to it. And it's trained me in this way where anytime I, I look at my GPS and I'm like going to work, I'm like, that can't be the right direction. And I deviate. I always get punished because it takes like three times longer. So now I just follow my GPS religiously and I don't know directions to anything. So I could totally see this playing that type of role. Yeah. And you think you can automate it pretty easily, right? The decision-making process. And some would argue it removes the discretion and the biases. Yeah. Because others would say, well, there's discre there's bias built into the AI as well, right? Yeah. And I think once it gets more information than like maybe what even a judge knows, then there's going to be a level of fear where like if a judge rules differently than the AI, it's going to, they're going to be worried they're making a mistake. Right. So I really love this topic. We never go late. We only stop at one, but I want to get the audience feedback, wrap it up, or do they want this discussion to continue a little bit more? Yes, I want to hear more, 62%. No, keep it to an hour, 38. Well, kind of a split call. We might go a few minutes late. If we want to hear more, we'll prepare an advanced topic for everybody. So thank you for answering the poll. Another poll question that we have for our audience, give everybody a minute to answer it. Do clients have, or do clients or their lawyers have freedom of choice anymore? It's kind of existential, but uh, sort of the matrix, blue pill, red pill. And I looked it up, the red pill was freedom and the blue pill was you stay back in the matrix. So we'll see what our audience thinks. But Jerry, free will, do we have it? What's going on? Well, this, this is kind of a, um, too existential for me. I mean, I, in, in my opinion, 
the the idea of free will in law has always been kind of strange to me because for for example in family law you're trying to provide the best service for your clients right but in theory before the case even starts all of the facts are known so if you could just snap your fingers and get an outcome is that something people want to do that's like kind of a non answer for me but that's how i've thought about where this technology can can lead you because like i've mentioned before your digital footprint contains everything about your bank accounts to your children to allegations of abuse to to all the stuff that ai can sift through in an instant so um maybe you didn't have free will in the first place <laughs> so to speak yeah i know you have an opinion on this what do you think oh we don't have enough time um <laughs> you know I, I, luke asked the question do we ever have freedom of choice i mean you know, you get into this, uh, here's one of the thing that always blows my mind. You know, our decisions we make before we're consciously aware that we've made them. So something's operating in our brains to actually make decisions before we become consciously aware. Is that free? We're not consciously aware of it. Is that free will in the context of free will? But also the point, like, does AI change it? I don't know. I think the one thing that AI might do is as it starts to get it starts to pass the Turing test. So um, it's indistinguishable from human interaction. And then we have acceleration in robotics and you start being indistinguishable in, um, you know, humanoid forms that is going to create some challenges. Now you're into the matrix land because you're like, I can't tell the difference. And I think that that is actually more of a threat to all of this, you know, the deep fake technology, but the, our inability to distinguish between what's real and what's not real is creates a real problem in a lot of contexts particularly in the context of practice of law. Uh, some great audience questions, uh, comments, you know, AI is just sort of an extension of our research that we're doing already, you know, Westlaw or whatever. Another audience member saying, um, no, we went to law school, we passed the bar, AI, AI can't replace that. Well, actually AI is now passing the bar exam and many others, right? We talked about that at the beginning, but let's see what our clients think of freedom of choice. All right. Yes, of course we do. 63%. Okay, that's good. That's the red pill, right? Uh, subject to whatever the algorithms produce, 15%. No, Elon Musk is right. We're already there. Blue pill and others. So put it in the Q&A. Okay, so tipping point. Um, new frontier, Conrad, thoughts? And you can tell us about free will too if you want, whatever you want. No, I, I you no, I am I'm the econ, not philosophy major. He and I come from this, come from our academic backgrounds on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I, I mean, the 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 interesting thing for me, and and again, Jerry hit this at the very beginning. I don't want this to get lost at all. It is what what we have not seen yet, but what I can see, and I think this is why Google freaked out. Um, not about content written for SEO, which what I oh I spoke out earlier, but is it possible that consumer behavior changes from a search perspective to individually assisted content generation that is so unbelievably specific that you no longer go to a search query that it's going to send you to a page that is going to answer probably most of your questions, probably, right? And they're trying to ascertain whether or not that is the best content to answer most of those questions given a single query. That changes when you can actually change your search behavior where you're not looking for that answer. You are looking for something custom written for you, mm -hmm. right? I'm getting a divorce. I'm in Ottawa. I have three children. My middle son is autistic. We need uh, guide points to talk to them about our upcoming divorce because they are very worried that they'll never see their grandparents again, right? Write me something like that. Give me that assist, right? And that's where you get deeper into, I'm not looking, I'm not searching. I mean, searching is, it, it's such a, it, at this point in time, the word search means like, we feel like we're going to find something that we're, we're looking for and it's going to be pretty good. It also really means, I don't know the hell I'm going, right? And so I think we get to a point where it's possible that the consumer behavior changes to using AI to generate very, very specific individual guidance, right? And, and Jerry mentioned this at the beginning, um, you know, as someone is going through a divorce process, can they have AI generate advice, content, direction through, during that path multiple times a day? 
yeah, I think that is very possible that searcher behavior change or consumer behavior changes like that. We're no longer searching. We're starting to use AI to guide us individually. Yeah, I think you really hit a really important point there. You put your question into Google, you get some links, you got to do some more research. You put it, your facts and your family situation into AI, you get a result customized to your family. Right? 100%. All and, different and experience. The, the, the difference, the, the missing link here to making that happen right now is, is two things. Number one, consumer behavior. And number two, consumers do not trust AI in the same way they blindly trust Google to deliver good answers, right? Well, uh, they're just not used to it, right? <clears throat> it gets normalized. 100%. Yeah. Um, I love this it, comment that came in uh, from uh, our audience member. I met both clients and counselor who arguably yeah. do not pass the Turing test. <laughs> Over to you, Guy. New Frontier, tipping point. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I actually don't agree with a lot of what Conrad just said. So Conrad's <laughs> totally right about how legal services consumers are searching. Right. I guess the short version of where I think I disagree is we're not giving Google enough credit. Um, Google, yes, in, in 10 blue links form, yes, Google's not doing the same thing. You wanna tell me that with all of the best uh, engineers that, for, that they've been developing for years, all the best natural language processing people that they don't have, and, and I know people are gonna be like, well, Bard, you know, Bard got it wrong. Bard, Bard is like, their, that was like their PR move because they felt compelled to release something. Um, I cost 102 billion in stock. Yeah, not great, not great for market cap. But <laughs> let me tell you, you just don't count Google out quite yet. I think Google. I think the people, the higher ups at Google, like the people who really are, you know, have got this machine running in the background. That's not uh, public, by the way. Are like yikes! I don't know that we should release this into the wild because a hundred whatever billion market cap loss is going to be nothing compared to what people are going to see when we actually let this thing run free in the wild. And um, so I think they're taking a more measured approach. But look, I'm going to be very curious to see their foray into, they, they've, they're adding AI assist to uh, Google Workspace and they just announced that today. So if you're, you're G, if you're in a Google product, your Gmail, your task management stuff is going to have uh, AI recommendations. And, and again, here's the other thing too, forget about all that. The well, lead people want us to monetize it, right? They, how are we going to make money off? We we're not. That's we, another. We that's another problem. Search. Yeah, that's another problem, right? Yeah, that's like, a totally. We're selling clicks and paid search. How are we going to monetize AI if we let it out? Oh, totally. That's, that's, a, AdWords that's a valid. Cons that's a valid uh, topic as well. But here's my thing: <clears throat> just go listen to what um, the uh, lead of uh, the search team over the last, you know, twenty years has been talking about. You know, they keep saying we want to make the Star Trek computer. The Star Trek computer is in 10 blue links. They want to deliver answers. You're already seeing it with featured snippets and zero click results and all this stuff. They know that that's where, to Conrad's point, it's a better experience, right? People want that. Um, but to say that like all of a sudden people are just gonna overnight switch to chat GPT and Google's not gonna. Yeah, I, I'm not hey, saying hey, that I, Google. I, I wanna get is, Jerry in here too, but just give me, I understand Google has several AI models specific to certain tasks, right? And they're they're out of the park, and they've been using it for years. But now the public's catching on. Jerry, new to tipping point, new frontier, and then I'll give Karen Rad a couple seconds. Well, I, I was just thinking about what Guy was saying, and um, and maybe this just like makes Guy and I sound like such Google fanboys. So I'm just like a caveat here. But I, you know, the thing about what Google's doing is. And this ChatGPT thing is it's great PR, but I mentioned this earlier, it's actually just a single model that's text-based. And when you search in Google, it actually provides you results that are a lot more complicated because it has things like location, time of day, a lot of different factors. Yeah. And the, the whole large language model thing here is actually very far away from integrating these types of things. So it's this search model is going to be around until someone can solve this. And it's not really clear that you know, this whole open AI Microsoft uh, thing uh, can do that. So we're, we're still in the beginning phases and Google is going to punch back really hard here. Yeah, I agree. All right. So we want to be respectful of our audience's time. This is, we're going to wrap this up shortly, but um, quick poll question, Shannon, let's do some Q and A and then bring this train into the station. Uh, would you like an advanced topic on this presentation? So you can answer that poll. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for your participation and thank you so, so much for sending in all of your questions. We've had a lot come in, but we're gonna get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. So first up we have, what role, if any, should Google play in moderating AI produced content and search results? All right, who wants that one? Guy? Sure, I also have a few things to say. I mean, look, Google, Google does whatever it wants on Google, just like Twitter and Facebook do whatever they want. So like they're, they're already playing a role. They already have countermeasures in place to try to distinguish uh, between human created content and not human created content. Now, again, is it, does it, does it matter at the end of the day? I don't know. Um, because, you know, again, the distinction between like how much AI is more AI than person is like, uh, you know, uh, begging the question uh, to a certain extent, but um, you know, look, I think Google's going, Google's going to do, they're going to serve the results that they, their machine believes are the best experience for uh, the consumer. And Conrad brought this point up, but I actually agree with him on what happens when the AI response is better than what the human wrote on the page. Like Google's going to pay, you know, the signals are going to favor what the AI said. Right. I, produce, I produce AI content. I'm thinking, I don't think I can make this any better. <laughs> I'll probably make it worse if I start changing it. Conrad, I'm sorry. I cut you off there. 30 seconds quick. Finish your thought. Then we'll get one more question in. No, no. I, I think I, I it is very possible that the AI <clears throat> provider is Google, right? I don't think I don't think chat GPT is the answer necessarily. Right. AI is out of the box. <laughs> who Who builds the trust there is going to reap the upside of a change in consumer behavior. That's the key here. And we're not yet, we, I think we are far away from having trust in the system of, of AI generated content. I think we have gone way overboard in having trust in, in the crap that Google spits out to you. Sure. Um, and so it can swing back. So uh, last question here is how can artificial intelligence help improve access to justice in family law cases, particularly for those who cannot afford legal access? representation document preparation fact specifically research to your family acts um just basic information about the court system fantastic question let's wrap it up all right uh so oh, that did brings want, us sorry, to did the audience want more they did yes so um, 89%. Uh, 89%. Okay. can will you guys come back and do this again where well, they may want different people <laughs> No way. You, what you should have asked was, were these presenters any good? And <laughs> would you like to hear more about it, right? There'll be a survey. We'll find out. Do that the after we leave, question please. question is that they liked us. I don't know that that's... Uh, we'll find a, out who they like. <laughs> you, you're not on the naughty list. I'm sure of it. We should get ChatGPT on this panel. Yeah. <laughs> It already was because I used ChatGPT for some of my answers. <laughs> First, I want to thank Conrad, Jerry, Guy. Fantastic for content. Thank you for sharing today. And Shannon, you're fantastic as always. Great job. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon.